There's been really patronizing attitude from a lot of the nuclear armed states and some of their allies that, oh, if you don't possess nuclear weapons, you don't know what it's like. And you just need to let us deal with this situation. We know what's best for international peace and security. That's the voice of Ray Atchison, author of the book, Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, Feminist Studies on Peace, Justice, and Violence. They are today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Alex Hall. Welcome back to Press the Button. We have more good news. This past week, President Biden nominated Ambassador Laura Holgate to be the American representative to the Vienna Office of the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency, roles that she held in 2016. We also have good news out of Geneva, where the United States and Russia met to restart talks toward a new nuclear arms agreement. The U.S. team was led by Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and Under Secretary of State Bonnie Jenkins. Formal talks are expected to start in September. And Alex, you have some more somber news. Hi, Michelle. Yes, this week marks the anniversary of the United States dropping a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. You can deliver a message of hope and pledge to fold a paper crane with cranes for our future through this weekend. But let's get to today's show. What else is new on the nuclear front? On early warning, we talk about the latest developments in China. Satellite images revealed that it is building a second nuclear missile silo field. So we discuss what that means for Chinese nuclear strategy. We also continue our summer series of the ideas that came out of the New America Essay Contest, this time about how State Department should become an interagency leader in artificial intelligence technology. After that, I sit down with Ray Atchison to discuss their recent book, Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy. We dive into the process that led to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the diversity of voices behind the making of the treaty, and the ongoing efforts to encourage more states to sign onto this treaty. And this is, in fact, Alex's podcast debut, so definitely take a listen. Finally, our Hale fellow, Dr. Doreen Horshig, answers a question about the nuclear shell game on this week's Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at Press Button Pod or send us an email at pressthebutton at plowshares.org. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps to grow our show and our audience. We really appreciate it. But with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today I'm joined by Matt Corda, Research Associate at the Federation of American Scientists, and Ryan Dukeman, Senior Fellow at FP21 and a PhD student at Princeton University. Thank you both for joining. Thanks so much. Thank you. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. Matt, last week, the New York Times profiled your and your colleagues' discovery. Satellite images taken by Planet and analyzed by you and Hans Christensen show that China is building a second missile silo field with 110 silos under construction. With a previously reported field that's also under construction, what does this mean for Chinese nuclear forces? Yeah, so China's rapid construction of hundreds of missile silos effectively constitutes the most significant expansion of the Chinese nuclear arsenal ever. So with the silos that we recently discovered in eastern Xinjiang, plus the silos that um, Decker Everleth discovered in Yumen, it appears that overall China has close to about 250 silos under construction, which is more than 10 times the number of ICBM silos that they currently have in operation today. So if all of those silos are loaded with single warhead missiles, then the number of warheads on the Chinese ICBMs could potentially increase from, you know, about 185 warheads today to as many as 415 over the coming years. And if they're loaded with missiles that can carry multiple warheads, that number could go, you know, over 850 um, once those newly constructed silo fields are, are actually completed. And although it 
still kind of remains unclear at this stage how many of the silos will actually be filled with missiles. The silo construction in itself and China's other nuclear modernization programs, they're on a scale that would appear to contradict the country's longstanding policy to only field a minimum nuclear deterrent. That being said, it's also important to note that this still would not give China near parity with the nuclear stockpiles of Russia and the United States, each of whom have uh, nuclear warhead stockpiles of about 4,000 warheads. So why then do you think China is building them? So there's a, there's a few possible reasons why China is building these new silos. So there's a potential um, kind of a, a multilateral security factor. So you know, not only is China trying to posture against the United States as improving military arsenal, but increasingly they're also posturing against Russia and India as well. And in particular, they're probably concerned that improvements to those countries' missile defenses and conventional counterforce capabilities could potentially undermine China's ability to retaliate with nuclear weapons. There's also kind of a potential like prestige factor. Um, you know, big nuclear powers like Russia and the United States have big silo fields. Perhaps China wants to demonstrate that, that they're a serious nuclear player. So kind of overall, the decision probably hasn't been caused by one issue in particular, but more likely by a, a combination of some of those factors. And I guess kind of the, the last point that I would make is, you know, when we think about what do we do about this, um, you know, although China's nuclear modernization is driven by more factors than just the United States, if the U.S. wants to scale back China's nuclear buildup, it's going to have to do that through arms control. And that's going to require the U.S. to clearly articulate what it's willing to trade, um, with the best candidate being adding limitations to its own missile defenses in return for placing corresponding limitations on China's nuclear arsenal. Thanks, Matt. Ryan, switching gears, congratulations on your essay, which you and a co-author received an honorable mention for in New America's Reshaping U.S. Security Policy for the COVID Era Essay Competition. You published an article in War on the Rocks based on that work, looking at how the politics of data and artificial intelligence may soon become the politics of international securities. And for the United States, To win the data wars, you argue that the State Department should become an interagency leader in AI. Why is the diplomatic arena, rather than defense, for example, the right venue for this agenda? Absolutely. So we've seen a lot of talk over the last year about these kinds of gray rhino security threats. So events that build slowly, 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 and then hit you all at once, like a ton of bricks to continue mixing metaphors. And so obviously over the last year, it's been made obvious to us that pandemics are one such type of event. And we think that artificial intelligence, or I think that artificial intelligence represents the next kind of gray rhino, these sorts of slow building threats that are going to hit us all at once if we're not appropriately prepared. We've seen how artificial intelligence is enabling the expansion of so-called digital authoritarianism around the world, most prominently but not exclusively in China, um, by enabling tighter control over citizens and tighter restrictions on human rights. We're also seeing a growing conversation in the defense community around the military aspects of AI-enabled weaponry or AI-enabled military tools and techniques. So to answer your question, I think that the uh, artificial intelligence is important to be led on by the diplomatic core because diplomats have this unique um, training and ability to focus on the intersecting human rights, economic, and security applications of genuinely cross-domain issues such as artificial intelligence. So one of the problems that we talk about in the essay is that So far, the U.S. government has overwhelmingly focused its attention and resources and policy development on the security aspects of AI as a military toolkit within, as you say, the Defense Department and its research arms primarily, and then as an economic windfall, um, largely driven by the Trump administration's Office of Science and Technology policy, so focusing on how we can uh, develop American advanced industries and emerging technology. And we think that part of the problem in these approaches is that they intrinsically prioritize or exclusively focus on those security and economic aspects of artificial intelligence without focusing as well on their political or human rights implications. Um, And where we see a genuine competition developing between digital authoritarian models of governance at home and abroad um, in China and elsewhere contrasted with 
um, more rights respecting democratic approaches to artificial intelligence and big data, we need a more integrated approach. And that kind of cross cutting um, approach to, to cross functional issue domains is one that the diplomatic corps is uniquely skilled to take on within the USG. Now, as you mentioned, there's already these existing investments in other areas of the government. What would it take for a state to become an interagency leader? So in the essay, I talk about the bureaucratic transformation that would have to happen in the State Department in order to truly become uh, the, the gold standard in the interagency for leading on issues of artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. Some of these have to do with the sticky politics of organizational reform and the contentiousness of reforming org charts. Under the Trump administration, state moved to set up a Bureau for Cybersecurity and Emerging Technologies, uh, which was then put on hold by the House. But that Bureau was to be set up under the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security. So intrinsically prioritizing the security and military aspects of artificial intelligence to the exclusion, relative exclusion of human rights and economic domains. So as we think about not just the location of such an office or effort, I think we need both. We need to think about this as an effort that has a dedicated home within the diplomatic apparatus and one that is mainstreamed in terms of subject matter expertise across all elements of American diplomacy. That's where you get into more achievable reforms, such as more advanced training or re recruiting among different populations of subject matter experts into what's traditionally been a very generalist diplomatic recruiting model. That could look like things like having a dedicated technology policy officer in every regional and functional bureau in the State Department. So there's ways that we can do this that are a little bit less contentious than the politics of, you know, who gets this box on the org chart that still try and make AI and emerging technologies a mainstreamed, analytically competent subject area for a much larger share of diplomats uh, at home and overseas in the State Department than is the case today. Well, with that, our time is up. Matt, Ryan, thank you so much for joining. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Ray Atchison's recent book, Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, dives deep into the advocacy and diplomacy efforts that led to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also referred to as the Ban Treaty. This entered into force just earlier this year. Ray is the director of Reaching Critical Will, the disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and represents them on the steering committees of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. I'm thrilled to be joined by Ray today to discuss their new book. Ray, welcome to Press the Button. Thanks so much for having me on. To start, I'd love for you to tell us a bit about the importance of making this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons international law. And how does this differ from previous nuclear treaties, say bilateral treaties? The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or the Nuclear Ban or the TPNW, um, it's the first categorical prohibition of nuclear weapons that we have. So other bilateral treaties or um, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, they don't categorically outlaw the possession of nuclear weapons um, for all states. Um, so really the TPNW is putting nuclear weapons on equal footing with the other weapons of mass destruction like chemical and biological weapons, which are both categorically outlawed, um, as well as landmines and cluster bombs and other weapon systems that the international community has deemed to be inherently injurious and um, indiscriminate and causing excessive humanitarian harm. So of course, nuclear weapons fit into that category being one of the most destructive weapons in the world and yet have not until this time um, been prohibited. And so while the treaty doesn't include parameters for elimination that will come later, so that's the way it differs for from say bilateral reduction instruments, it's a comprehensive prohibition on all nuclear weapon activities, and it sets the stage for um, a verified process for the elimination of nuclear weapon programs globally. On that note, just now, and in your book, you mention how those standards set by the Ottawa Landmine Treaty, for instance, 
influenced this treaty negotiations. Can you describe a bit about the precedent that that treaty set for the TPNW? The main precedent that it really guided us towards is that banning weapons that cause grave humanitarian suffering and um, harm to the environment and that are indiscriminate is is an imperative for the international community. And so the landmine treaty really provided us with a model of prohibiting a weapon system completely and also of providing positive obligations for states in terms of victim assistance and environmental remediation. Um, It also offers a model of how states that reject a weapon can come together with activists and organizers and survivors and humanitarian agencies to really do something that the main users or producers of the weapons don't want them to do. And so with the landmines treaty and then with the cluster bombs treaty, it was both of those were guided by like-minded countries who went against the interests of uh, users and producers of these weapons um, and worked directly with affected communities in order to prohibit them. And I think the other thing that really the landmine model gave us is an example of how we can challenge normative understandings of concepts like military necessity, um, which are which was thrown around with landmines. You know, a lot of uh, military commanders said you can't prohibit these weapons; they're absolutely necessary in conflict. Um, and so it was really elevating the humanitarian concerns of these weapons to counter that military necessity argument and putting the lives of people over what the military said it needed to do. So it really taught us how we could do that um, and uh, be successful through an international process. And the last thing I think that really the landmine and cluster bomb treaties modeled for us was the importance of changing international law to affect what's considered normative and to stigmatize weapon systems. And that that can lead to practical implications like economic divestment from a weapon system and changing the policies of those who originally said they wouldn't join the treaties and who boycotted the processes. That's happened in in both cases. Amazing. And on that note, your book puts this incredible spotlight on the discrimination that people and countries and even whole continents face in the international arena. From the feminist to the indigenous perspective, you go deep into the links that it took to ensure the inclusion of these previously discriminated areas, such as the global south or non-nuclear states, in nuclear negotiations. Can you talk a bit about how these efforts were received at the UN and your perspective from that experience? Yeah, the majority of the world's countries that were part of this process at the UN um, were very open to this and excited to hear um, from people that they didn't normally hear from in the nuclear issue. Um, I think this really helped open up opportunity for governments to engage on this issue that hadn't necessarily. So I'm thinking, you know, governments of Um, the global south from non-nuclear armed countries in particular that have been treated for years as if they have no relevant security interests related to nuclear weapons. Um, You know, there's been really patronizing attitude from a lot of the nuclear armed states and some of their allies that, oh, if you don't possess nuclear weapons, you don't know what it's like. And um, you just need to let us deal with this situation. We know what's best for international peace and security. And um, you don't really get to have a say in, in this. And also, you know, pressure from them to be silent about this issue and to not rock the boat for many, many years. So I think also including the indigenous perspectives and feminist perspectives and bringing in a lot of activists and organizers from the campaign from the Global South really opened up space for government delegates as well to see a different um, different perspectives, different voices and faces that were speaking about this issue. I think also the indigenous perspectives offered a lot of new experience and expertise um, into the UN conference rooms. Um, You know, a lot of delegates may have heard over the years from some Japanese survivors from the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but I think expanding that community of 
of survivors of hibakusha, of affected community, of those who've been living under nuclear weapons, whether it's from production and uranium mining through testing um, and radioactive waste storage, all of those elements um, are, are kind of swept under the rug in international conversation. And so bringing those voices and perspectives into the room was really, really important to hear from a range of people. And I think this really opened up the scope as well on the conversation around the humanitarian and environmental critique of nuclear weapons, which was really at the core of the process to ban nuclear weapons through what we called the humanitarian initiative, um, drawing attention to uh, real impacts and lived reality instead of just relying on the sort of stale geostrategic political discourse and all the all the techno speak that um, is usually dominating during UN discussions, um, but instead focusing on what's actually happening when nuclear weapons are used or produced or tested. And then in terms of the feminist perspectives, I think that this really resonated with a lot of diplomats actually. Um, they noted that the nuclear armed state representatives were calling them emotional and irrational um, for supporting a ban treaty, for wanting to discuss humanitarian and environmental impacts of nuclear weapons. Um, so I think that sort of was eye-opening to a lot of folks engaged in this process, that there really is a patriarchal element to how the nuclear armed countries engage others um, and think about others and think about how they really think about nuclear disarmament. Um, and then I think a lot of uh, delegations also see this as a gender equity issue in terms of participation, who's in the room, who's speaking, um, who's leading discussions. And so the dynamics uh, around the TPNW negotiations were quite different than they normally are in the non-proliferation treaty meetings or other UN discussions on nuclear weapons. And then I think others were really um, alarmed by the research around gendered harms caused by ionizing radiation and how um, women and girls' bodies can be disproportionately affected. Um, so I really think that all these new perspectives and ideas and approaches um, and critiques, overall, it helped to open up the challenge to deterrence narratives and to security discourses from different perspectives and angles and um, brought in an element of defiance that was really important to this work. And, you know, you dedicate a whole chapter to describing how these connections between the feminist or civil rights movements really tie into um, what was occurring in these negotiations today, um, particularly what was happening in the 70s and perhaps how that links to today. I was wondering if you could share with our listeners the key connections you think that the nuclear justice initiatives can take alongside with other justice efforts that are currently gaining momentum. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a strong connection between um, racism and structural discrimination and nuclear colonialism and imperialism. And these connections were drawn uh, long before, as you say, in the in the 60s and 70s. Um, and Vincent Ntondi writes about this in his book, African Americans Against the Bomb, where he's looking at positions of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King and Bernard Rustin and, and others that really were vocal against nuclear weapons and drew the links between the experiences of Black people in the United States and where nuclear weapons were being tested abroad. So the French were testing in Algeria and the British were testing um, in the outback of Australia and the US and France were testing in the Pacific um, and harming people of color around the world primarily um, with their atmospheric nuclear tests. Um, and the women's movement and feminist movements in this time frame as well were also strongly connected to the anti-nuclear movement um, in terms of leadership from these communities, but also in terms of the feminist critique of nuclear weapons as tools of patriarchy and as, as tools of violent masculinity, looking at the social constructions of gender, of the roles of men and women, um, and the elimination of any other kind of identity, um, and how that was really connected to um, to weapons and war and conflict. So there's a lot of connections historically between these movements. And I think it's 
really important to continue this analysis into the present day. Um, and there's all kinds of connections, of course, now that we can draw between the abolitionist movements um, for nuclear weapons and for war and militarism more broadly to the work that's going on to abolish police, to abolish prisons, to abolish borders. Um, all of these are elements of state violence that um, we are confronting every single day, um, many people in their lived reality. And connecting up how the industries in terms of, you know, the weapons, nuclear weapon producers being directly engaged in militarization of the border, for example, or the ways in which weapons being used at war are then sold at discounted rates to, poli uh, rates to police forces, um, the ways in which uh, structural discrimination, racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, how all those are bound up in the ways that we order our societies and um, enforce uh, dominance of particular groups. There's so many connections between all of these movements. And I think the more that we can understand the, the structures of power that we're confronting and challenge them together, the better off all of our abolitionist movements will be. I couldn't agree more. And um, to hone in on kind of one example of breaking the status quo, in the book you describe this amazing, and I have to say really surprising, moment that led up to the humanitarian impact meeting in Oslo when it became clear that the meeting was going to be boycotted by all nuclear weapon states except for India and Pakistan. And you describe how this boycott in fact enticed more states to become involved in these preparations for what would become the ban treaty. Can you describe what the motivating factor was there for these non-nuclear states to join in those conversations? I think one of the main motivations was really having the opportunity to have a say about nuclear weapons. Um, like I mentioned before, there was so much patriarchal patronizing um, rhetoric that they had to put up with for so many years from the nuclear armed states, real gaslighting, you know, from the nuclear armed states saying these these weapons are not a problem. We have it all under control. This has nothing to do with you. Um, so I think that for them to be confronted with a boycott by the nuclear armed states refusing to show up to a meeting that is about their weapons that only nine of them possess and they won't even come and talk about it um, was really just outrageous um, for a lot of non-nuclear armed states and I think gave them even more incentive to show up and have these conversations. Well, if they're not going to deal with it, we're going to deal with it without you. Um, and I think that, you know, it was also a chance to forge ahead with something practical and meaningful that the majority of countries in the world support and is a rare instance if the nuclear armed states aren't in the room, then they can't block it because that's what they do at the UN. They block everything. They try and water it down to a lowest common denominator, or they just prevent any movement at all from going forward. And so this was really the first chance we've had in a very long time to make any kind of progress on nuclear disarmament. I think also a mo motivation was really in terms of policy priorities for a lot of countries. Um, over many years since the landmine treaty and even before, this concept of humanitarian disarmament has taken on great importance for a lot of countries. And they really think this is something that they can contribute to and have been leaders in banning landmines and cluster bombs, um, leading on the arms trade treaty, you know, all of these instruments that have been developed um, since the 90s. And then having an opportunity to take this forward with nuclear weapons, I think was a point of, of pride and honor and privilege for a lot of these countries and felt that they had something really positive to contribute now that there was space finally for them to do so. And I think, you know, a lot of people say that the TPNW was born out of frustration. And that is part of the story, of course, frustration with the nuclear armed states for violating their non-proliferation treaty commitments, um, for showing up with a dictionary instead of disarmament. You know, they created this like nuclear terminology glossary and brought that to the 
non-proliferation treaty review conference instead of fulfilling any of the you know 20 odd nuclear disarmament commitments they'd actually made um and investing in modernization of nuclear weapons expanding their arsenals all of this stuff is very frustrating and of course the treaty came from that context but i think it's also important to reflect that the treaty doesn't come out of negativity but actually it comes from positivity it comes from the majority of countries as well as activists and survivors and humanitarian agencies coming together to do something that's powerful and necessary and morally right um, and really standing up as a collective to the nuclear armed bullies and their allies despite all of the pressure that they faced not to do so so I have to ask, what do you say to critics that claim that the success of the treaty is limited as long as nuclear and NATO states remain non-signatories? I'd say this isn't the end. Um, the TPNW is a tool, and we've always envisioned it as a tool in order to achieve nuclear disarmament. Um, and what we've seen with the other treaties banning weapons that I described earlier is that in all of these cases, not every state is on board at first, um, but the process of negotiating a treaty, adopting the treaty, implementing the treaty, it builds up the normative understandings of what's acceptable. Um, it builds up the stigmatization of the weapon and a social expectation of non-use of these weapons and then of non-possession um, and of more responsible behavior from the international community. And so this social and political stigmatization then leads to practical changes in policies. So it can lead to economic divestment from the weapons, um, stopping investment in production of the weapons, um, undercutting one of the core motivations for nu nuclear weapons, especially in the US context, where we're talking about billions of dollars every year being spent on modernizing the nuclear arsenal. Um, this has really worked with, with cluster bombs, for example. The United States still hasn't joined the Convention on Cluster Munitions, but the last producer of cluster bombs in the United States closed up shop. It said there's no longer economically viable to produce these weapons. Um, and uh, same thing with landmines in terms of use. You know, the U.S. still hasn't joined the landmine treaty and yet has a policy that it won't use landmines anywhere other than the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. So we can see how policy changes will follow, even if you know, holdout states still claim that they don't accept the treaty. Their behavior is forced to join over time. Um, and we're already seeing this with the nuclear ban treaty in terms of divestment in particular. So even before we had the treaty, we started doing a lot of divestment work, getting pension funds and banks to, to pull out their money from, from nuclear weapon producing companies. Um, and since the treaty has been adopted and, and now entered into force, uh, more and more of these financial institutions are saying, okay, well, now nuclear weapons are illegal, so we're not going to invest in them anymore. So we're already seeing the impacts of this, and it will continue to build over time um, and eventually uh, help us achieve nuclear disarmament. That's a great lead to my final question, which is for our listeners, particularly those that may live in nuclear armed states and not be that optimistic about a path forward, what advice would you have to help them get involved in this movement? There's a lot of different initiatives that ICANN is running at the moment, um, including in the nuclear armed states. So of course, we're working on getting um, universal adherence to the treaty. So trying to get more and more states to accede to the treaty now that it's entered into force. Um, but beyond that, in the countries that don't currently support the treaty, um, we have several different initiatives people can join. So one is the ICANN Cities Appeal, which is getting local um, city councils and um, other local legislatures to say that they support the treaty and to call on the federal government to join. We have an ICANN Parliamentary Pledge, um, which is getting members of parliament or in the US uh, Congress and the Senate to voice their support for the treaty um, and to call for debates um, within Parliament or Congress to, to discuss the treaty and nuclear disarmament. We have our divestment initiative, which is Don't Bank on the Bomb, um, which is both about getting your city pension funds or your personal pension funds 
but also just your personal bank account, where you keep your money, getting your own bank to divest from nuclear weapon producing companies. Um, and then for students, we have um, a schools of mass destruction project in the United States that looks at, looks at how some university programs are connected directly to uh, nuclear weapon producing companies, you know, whether through internships or um, R&D uh, fellowships and things like that. So there's all kinds of ways to, to get involved. And then I think the other thing that I always like to say too, is that you don't have to work on nuclear weapons to work on nuclear weapons, right? You can be part of the movements to abolish and defund the police or to divest from fossil fuels or other climate justice activities or working on decolonization or feminist or queer organizing. And you can bring the nuclear critique into all of those movements and into your broader analysis of, of structural change that's needed. Um, and really, I think where we're going to have success in within the nuclear armed states is going to be coalitions of movements for ordering our societies differently, for divesting from weapons of violence and systems of violence and redirecting that, that money into care and housing and education and justice. And finally, where can our listeners find your book? Uh, the best way at the moment to order it is online directly from the publisher, which is Roman and Littlefield. Um, it'll ship anywhere in the world. Um, but you can also ask your local bookstore or your library to purchase it, um, which is really great to support both local businesses and libraries. And it also helps get it into the hands of, of more people, which is great. Please don't shop at Amazon. <laughs> That's my one request. Find it anywhere else um, other than there. Well, thank you so much, Ray. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the pod. Great, thanks so much. And now, for everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A, are you ready, Doreen? Let's hear it, Tom. This week's question comes from Owen from Raleigh. Owen asks, you may have covered this in the past, but I'd like to see where you stand on shell games and whether they are destabilizing. Yeah, thanks, Owen, for the excellent and, um, of course, very timely question. For some listeners that might hear the term for the first time, let me just briefly explain what we really mean by shell game. So this is basically when a country has a large number of missile silos, only some of which are filled with intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver nuclear warheads. Having numerous silos enables the country to sort of shuttle them around. The empty silos essentially become decoys. And with the discovery of the two new nuclear missile bases in China this month, this potential shell game has received quite a bit of attention. Some experts consider that China may be building these silos to use this shell game approach. Now, why would China want to do that? Well, the silos are spaced across 700 square miles so that no two could be knocked out by one nuclear warhead. The U.S. had actually considered such a shell game during the Cold War, which um, James Ackman and Jeffrey Lewis have discussed in recent op-eds and podcasts. But back to your question, Owen, on whether all this is destabilizing. Well, in the short term, it arguably can actually strengthen deterrence because an adversary would need to strike each silo with multiple high-precision nuclear warheads to guarantee that they are destroyed. And a rational actor would reconsider such a large-scale attack. And a smaller attack then would mean that some ICBMs would be left for retaliatory strikes. And with its silo, China is seeking um, survivability to try to escape the pressure of America's first strike advantage. Now, while it's still speculative as to why they're doing this, it would be an expected, though very regrettable, response to American and Russian modernization and their missile defense programs. Because in the long term, the shell game can hardly be called stabilizing. As we can see in the responses to Chinese developments, it can cause opponents to A, respond by increasing their own nuclear st stockpiles, or B, modernizing their forces. So this is really a recipe for a spiral model into a second nuclear arms race that's driven by mutual fear of the adversaries and military industrial interests. Another week, another question. Thanks, Doreen, and thanks, Owen, for the great question. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, 
shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Alex Hall in Washington, D.C. and Delphine Vigil in San Francisco. With research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design and audio engineering by Michael Padilla at the Soundport Recording Studio in Grass Valley, California. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.